Good evening. Welcome. I'm Deborah Crone, Chair of Academic Programs here at BGC, and it is a special pleasure to welcome two speakers this evening. Many, many of us, and especially many, many alums here, it's wonderful especially to see all the alums in the audience, uh, will remember Anne Marguerite Tartsinas, now about to complete her dissertation at Stanford University, and received her MA from the Bard Graduate Center in 2010. Um, she then worked in the gallery for six years as a, assistant and then associate curator, and during that time curated an exhibition called An American Style, Global Sources for New York Textile and Fashion Design, 1915 to 1928, in 2013, and published a book on the same topic. It was one of our, our earlier focus project publications. Um, She's currently visiting faculty member in the Graduate Curatorial Practice Program at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco, and is the author, together with Nancy Troy, of Mondrian's Dress, Yves Saint Laurent, Pete Mondrian, and Pop Art, being published by MIT in October, right? Which is, do you have copies of it here yet? Has it actually emerged? So, and now I'm going to introduce Nancy Troy, who is the Victoria and Roger Sant Professor in Art Emerita at Stanford University, and during the current academic year, the Kress Beinecke Professor at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Her long-standing interest in Mondrian and the many publications on the members of the Dutch design group De Style are known to many students and colleagues here and um, started at the beginning of her career with an exhibition that took place at Yale while Nancy was still in graduate school uh, called Mondrian and Neoplasticism in America, which was also a book. And she has published a steady stream since then of books and articles on these issues, as well as modern art and fashion, um, couture culture in 20, uh, that was it's a typo, 20. 13, Architecture and Cubism in 1997, Modernism and the Decorative Arts in France, Art Nouveau to Le Corbusier, 1991, and the De Style Environment in 1983. In addition to all of this, she has been the recipient of countless fellowships and awards and was the editor-in-chief of the Art Bulletin for 10 years. So Nancy's going to start out three years? Okay. Well, well, your, your CV... In any case, a very, very accomplished speaker, and please, please come and, and begin your talk. And thank you for both for being here this evening. It's great to see you. Ten years, the Art Bulletin almost killed me, so I'm really, I, that was only three years, but I thought it was really a hard assignment, so... Anyway, I'm thrilled to be here. I've, I've spoken once before at Bard, but I think in a like a smaller group. So this is a really robust audience, and um, I'm thrilled. And I think I'm I can speak for Anne at least to the extent of saying we're both thrilled to be here and to share with you um, our book, the title you heard, and it's on the screen, which is coming out indeed on October 24th and we you have a little flyer about it but yeah the book doesn't exist quite yet so we're in advance and um, we're excited to to share this with you and so um, I think uh, my subtitle speaks to the kind of um, issues around authorship that um, this this dress Mondrian's dress or Yves Saint Laurent's dress, or or something like that, um, bring up. Now, at the beginning of August 1965, when Yves Saint Laurent introduced a line of cocktail dresses that fashion journalists immediately identified with the work of Pete Mondrian, the young French couturier, recently turned 29, had never seen an original work by the Dutch painter, who had by then been dead for more than two decades. Yet the stylistic affinity of Saint Laurent's adaptations to Mondrian's classic paintings based on reproductions in a book by Mondrian's biographer Michel Sufour 
seemed unmistakable to those who saw them at the time. Quote, did you ever see art walking? That's Eugenia Shepard, doyenne of the American Fashion Press, and it's the question she asked in her column for the New York Herald Tribune. It's right off the Museum of Modern Art's walls and onto the backs of the girls in the new collection Eve has designed. His mother gave him a book on Mondrian for Christmas, and that's how it all started. The rave dresses in the show, she continued, are Eve's wool jersey shifts that look exactly like Mondrian paintings with black lines and unexpected blocks of color. They'll be copied all around the world, but the originals are museum pieces in their own right." End quote. This insistence on the almost perfectly overlapping visual identity of the paintings and the dresses and the ambiguity surrounding which ones were the originals and which were the copies was a hallmark of reporting on what Saint Laurent later described as his, quote, dialogue with art, which began with his Mondrian-inspired dresses. Many journalists offered witty commentary that built on this unmistakable likeness, and this is another column. Uh, Deirdre McSharry, fashion editor of London's Daily Express, who writes, um, Yves Saint Laurent, the boy genius of the, passion, of the Paris couture, sees the female form as a fine frame on which to hang a sizzling new modern art look. McSharry continued the analogy in her description of the couturier's compositional practice. Saint Laurent's designs, Saint Laurent designs his newly, excuse me, Saint Laurent designs his newsy dresses like an abstract painter lays out his canvas. And Ruby Graham in the Philadelphia Inquirer pushed the identity of paintings and dresses even further. Quote, Mondrian's will soon be hanging in thousands and thousands of closets as part of fall wardrobes, as well as on walls as part of modern art collections, she wrote. For Graham, a Mondrian in the closet was evidently no less authentic than a Mondrian on the wall. And the fundamental ambiguity between those destinations is precisely the point for all three journalists, because it highlights the interchangeability of art and fashion that is the legacy of what came to be known as Saint Laurent's Mondrian dress, but which, as far as Anne and I are concerned, might just as well be called Mondrian's Saint Laurent dress, or simply Mondrian's dress. In fact, the identity between painting and dress was much less stable than the journalists' accounts uh, would lead us to believe. To begin with, none of the 106 models in Saint Laurent's fall, winter 1965 couture collection were explicitly aligned with art in the printed program. You see the pages here and one page with the model that you see on the right. Um, I managed to figure out how to outline it in red <laughs> for this occasion, so I'm very proud of that. Um, in any case, um, so there were 106 kind of entries, some of which had coats attached and so on, um, but none of them said anything about um, art in those um, descriptions. Mondrian's name was nowhere mentioned in that document. And while those who saw Saint Laurent's collection read, readily acknowledged the connection of some of the designs with Mondrian's characteristic style of abstraction, the grid of black lines dividing a surface into rectangles, many of them white or nearly so, but some filled with one or another primary color, red, yellow, or blue, the press actually showed no inclination to distinguish between such dresses and others that bore little or no similarity to Mondrian's pictures. All of them became Mondrian dresses. So this is one of the kind of generating um, questions we had in um, following our research and doing this work. Um, what is often called a singular Mondrian dress was actually many dresses. But there were some that never were 
uh, published as Mondrian dresses, or only once or twice, and then seemed to disappear from the record. And there were others, as we will show you, that um, seemed weirdly to be Mondrian dresses without looking anything like Mondrian. So for an art historian, and we're not probably going to get into this this evening unless you want to talk about it in a question or Q&A, um, this sort of issue of likeness and whether a dress needs to look like a Mondrian dress in order to be a Mondrian, you know, all of these kind of questions of, around what is a Mondrian dress um, are, are, you know, have potentially really interesting kinds of um, background stories to be addressed because one might ask, uh, conceptually, does a Mondrian dress have to look like a Mondrian painting? And what is that relationship? And so on. And we know, as I said, that Yves Saint Laurent never really cared particularly about Mondrian until he made these Mondrian dresses. And lots of other people cared a lot about them. So he went back to caring about them. That's, that's actually what I think anyway. Even the sketch that you see on the left that inaugurated Women's Wear Daily's coverage of the collection which placed the model in front of a 1926 diamond painting by Mondrian, which is now in the collection of the National Gallery of Art. Even here, women's wear illustrated a dress that does not display a grid, let alone any of the bright colors we might expect um, to see, um, given the proximity to this painting by Mondrian. In fact, just as it was being established, the category of the Mondrian dress seems to have encompassed several designs that were actually not inspired by the Dutch artist's paintings. What we have in this instance here on the left is the dress itself, and then the drawing that you saw is a long sleeve dress in black and white. Actually, we learned in our research that um, it was actually light blue, very light blue, as we know from a surviving fabric swatch. Though this was um, invisible in women's wear, a trade paper published um, exclusively in black and white, and also in the uh, French magazine from which the image on the left is derived, that is also only black and white images. So you wouldn't know that it was maybe baby blue with black, but in any case, it doesn't um, have much of a relationship with Mondrian. By silhouetting the sketch against a reproduction of a painting by Mondrian, a strategic association is made with the Dutch artist's work. Moreover, such a painting is mentioned as a source of Saint Laurent's design in the accompanying article, quote, watch a revolution in Saint Laurent fabrics, where color mixed with more color makes a solid color dress completely out of fashion. A secret fabric source whispers Saint Laurent um, and says Saint Laurent has based his collection on the shapes of Mondrian paintings. Yet the garment, as I said, represented in the sketch involved nothing that would obviously link it to Mondrian's work. An association between the two was clearly indicated by the presence of the painting, but it could not be justified by comparison with the dress that was illustrated alongside it. You'll notice that the model in the sketch seems to have a, scar a scarf that possibly is grid-like in its uh, design, so maybe that was a gesture in the direction of a Mondrian composition, but none of those scarves seems to have survived, so nobody really valued it uh, particularly, or seems not to have valued it enough to, to keep them in the archive. In our book, Anne and I show and discuss numerous other examples of this phenomenon, including a shocking pink dress on the right, edged in black that was exhibited as a Mondrian dress, and you see here the exhibition label in the retrospective that the Costume Institute of the Metropolitan Museum organized under the direction of Diana Vreeland to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Saint Laurent's work in Couture. And Saint Laurent and his partner Pierre Bauger were very much involved in um, the background of this exhibition. So we know that he could have read the labels, I guess, or uh, 
who knows if they got to that level of detail. But in any event, uh, Vreeland herself seems to have known little or nothing about Mondrian, so perhaps this shouldn't surprise us that much, that there would be a label like this one. But there are numerous other examples of this kind of discrepancy, and they seem not to have mattered to Saint Laurent or to Pierre Berger at the time. Anne and I demonstrate how such anomalies were eventually sidelined by the couture house as it focused on what might be described as canonical Mondrian dresses in order, we argue, to confirm Saint Laurent's association with art and to support the claim that his designs belong together with works of art in the finest museums in the world. And this happened especially toward the end of his career and after he uh, retired and then continuing after he died, um, these, there were numerous um, retrospective exhibitions in, in art museums. Now, and, and so I show a couple of those images here, the ones that actually have this particular model as their focus. There were many others um, in art museums around the world, in China, in uh, South America, and so forth. A classic example of how the Mondrian dresses were deployed in ways that highlighted Saint Laurent's commitment to fine art is the visit made by three mannequins. And I just want to point out, we use this term mannequin not to depersonalize the people wearing these dresses, which in the US we tend to call fashion models. But the model is actually the number associated with the dress. It's the original object which gets copied for couture clients and others. So when we say mannequin, we're referring to live mannequins who are wearing models of dresses. In this clip, as you'll see, there is a French you know, voiceover, but um, it's very unclear, so I'm just going to talk about it as you, as you see it here. We see mannequins wearing three different models of Mondrian dresses to the Mondrian retrospective exhibition at the Musée de l'Orangerie in Paris in 1969. The young women, no doubt sent by the couture house, where would one find three women who happen to be wearing such dresses other than that? So the mannequins performed a short promenade in front of several paintings, at one per point turning 360 degrees. It was, after all, a fashion show to reveal the backs of the dresses. At the end, the three gather, as you see, side by side to pose for photographers before Mondrian's composition with yellow, blue, and red of 1939 to 42. One of the mannequins, during her tournée, with exhibition catalog in hand, stops ever so briefly to examine several paintings, as if modeling uh, the behavior now of a typical exhibition visitor. I'm going to see if I, if I click backward whether I can get the thing to run again. Fashion mannequin and Mondrian admirer, the two distinct identities have merged into one, just as the paintings have become fashionable dresses. That this is indeed what viewers thought was happening is confirmed in the film itself. Standing within earshot of the mannequins in front of what may be Mondrian's most austere canvas, lozenge composition with two lines of 1931, a reporter interviewed the artist's friend and biographer, Michel Soufour, the author of the 1957 book that Saint Laurent had received from his mother. He asked Soufour to discuss his reactions to unexpectedly seeing Mondrian's paintings walking around in the galleries, as well as hanging on the walls. In response, Soufour claimed that Mondrian had been, quote, after all, quite content with fashion. Pointing out that the painter wanted his art to engage actively with life, he said Mondrian would have been happy to see his paintings walking on pretty legs. It's perfect. Mondrian would have been delighted. And indeed, we know that Mondrian admired fashionable clothes, particularly men's suits, which he modeled in numerous photographs where he is seen posing in his studio alongside his paintings. 
In the 1942 portrait by Arnold Newman at Wright, Mondrian sports the suit and tie that he customarily wore when he expected visitors, as we also see in the photograph on the left, and he stands somewhat casually, if nevertheless self-consciously, with legs crossed just above the ankles. The image is carefully constructed so that the rectangular arrangements of the space in which Mondrian was posing are repeatedly echoed and reinforced as the artist looks toward the viewer, his slim torso offset by his right arm, bent at a 90 degree angle or almost. The resulting pose participates in a tour de force of taut compositional relationships that beautifully aligns with the carefully arranged interior spaces in which Newman presented the painter. Much like many mannequins who later modeled Saint Laurent's uh, Mondrian dresses, as if all of them, Mondrian included, were performing the geometric character of his art. This happened over and over again. In the middle, that's in 1966, at the Gemeente Museum in The Hague, which has the largest collection of Mondrian paintings. And they were thrilled to have dresses to show because it brought people into the galleries who probably would not have come to see these austere paintings by Mondrian, or that's what they thought at the time. And then this is a model from the original sort of um, photographic publicity around these dresses. We know that, for example, Mondrian um, modeled, we might say, the geometric character of his paintings when he danced, as he famously did both in Paris and in New York with um, people, um, artists who, whose names we know. In any event, this is a letter by a friend of his, an artist who lived in the same building and who shows sort of the chaos of the outside world on the left. And then you enter Mondrian's studio, which he had kind of arranged and put colors on the walls that suggest that you are in a, a kind of three-dimensional rendering of his paintings projected into a future world of architecture and design. And Mondrian is shown dancing through the Charleston to what this artist, Gerard Hordyke, described as the most strongly syncopated records of jazz music, which Mondrian played on a phonograph he had painted red. Um, so this is a kind of, not only to sound and to music and to dance, but also to costume and fashion, where we suggest. While Hordyk secured the connection between Mondrian's studio environment, his performative body, and jazz music, Newman's photograph resonates with other images to secure the connection between Mondrian's painting and fashion, which probably Newman would be horrified to hear. Uh, the hallmark of Saint Laurent's most famous designs 23 years later, but an association that was already being made explicit in the 1940s. The not-so-subtle play in his portrait between posed body, planar forms, and linear elements, set in a layered but nevertheless relatively shallow space, makes it uncannily similar to a fashion image by John Rawlings that appeared in a Vogue editorial spread on the, quote, un cluttered sweater look in 1945. This photograph was accompanied by a caption that puts Mondrian's art in dialogue with a floor-length cotton knit dress described as, quote, the ultimate degree of unclutter. It clings to your own cont contour, leaves a smooth area for the distribution of chosen jewels, like the lines of the abstract painting. The reference is to composition with red, yellow, and blue, 1935 to 42, now in the collection of SF MoMA, visible as well in Newman's photographic portrait of the artist. In the fashion context, the painting, which hangs on a wall in the background of the photograph, mirrors the tall, slim shape of the simply yet elegantly dressed mannequin, whose belted waist and plentiful bracelets recapitulate the prominent horizontal lines of Mondrian's long, vertically-oriented painting. Once these two photographs are brought into proximity with one another, it is impossible, we think, to miss the parallels between them, even as each conveys particular features of the professional world that it represents. 
one cannot escape the sense that in Newman's portrait, Mondrian is posing as if he were a fashion mannequin. Like the Vogue mannequin of 1945, or so many other young women who would later pose in Saint Laurent's Mondrian dresses, often in proximity to Mondrian's paintings, as we saw earlier, and the artist's body language formally invokes his nearby paintings, the one playing off the others in a continuous loop of carefully organized reciprocal relations. As we contemplate the Mondrian dresses designed by Saint Laurent, in which the painting style was appropriated to be recast in a very different medium, the style became Saint Laurent's own, though to be sure without losing its identification with Mondrian. And as his dresses were in turn copied ad infinitum, most often with little or no attention to the refined craftsmanship characteristic of couture. So the image on the right is intended to convey this. It starts with a couture dress and it winds up for, you know, the fourth dress in the middle of that spread cost, you know, less than $10. So um, they go from extremely expensive couture dresses to very, very available copies. Um, the style we suggest, began to function as something like a well-known and instantly recognizable brand icon in which competing authorial associations had been invested but were no longer fully protected. At that point, the style circulated as if unmoored, our favorite photograph, arguably without a per, uh, persuasive connection to the distinguishing material features of either Mondrian's or Saint Laurent's carefully constructed work. To put this another way, <coughs> if a couture model of a Mondrian dress represents its authorship as split between the claims of the painter and the designer, the relative stability of that situation was threatened when the two terms, Mondrian and Saint Laurent, were drained of their original meanings by the proliferation of knockoffs ever more remote from the prototypes, whether dresses or paintings. <coughs> In this sense, Mondrian's style, his authorship, and his paintings became inextricably intertwined, some might say utterly confused, and what rapidly emerged as the ubiquity of not only Saint Laurent's, Mondrian Saint Laurent's fashion creations, but also, and arguably more significantly, the copies they engendered. Thus the unique and authentic character of Mondrian's individual paintings entered into a new kind of dialogue, not just with couture dresses, but with the full range of knockoffs as well. Saint Laurent drew Mondrian into the world of haute couture and also inevitably into the world of mass production and commodity culture with which couture was inextricably bound up during the 1960s and arguably actually much earlier. It did not take long for this process to manifest itself in popular visual culture. So another favorite photograph is from a knitting handbook that kind of shows these, these kinds of designs on the models that look a little, or the mannequins, I guess, that look a little different from the ones we've seen so far. So uh, we're in popular visual culture, then also pop art, and in the museum sites that were intimately connected in their shared engagement with Mondrian's style as both original and copy. The style was devised by Mondrian in the utopian context of vanguard art during the interwar period, appropriated by Saint Laurent in the mid-1960s when it also circulated in the work of Roy Lichtenstein and Tom Wesselman, among many others. Even the work of Andrew Andy Warhol, Anne and I argue, resonates with the broad contours of Mondrian's dress. So if I've kind of sketched out some of what we look at in the book, um, Anne is going to provide a more um, kind of rigorous, I think a deeper dive into the argument we present in one particular chapter of our book.
Thank you, Nancy. And just I would like to echo the thanks to Andrew and Nadia, uh, Jason and the team, and especially Susan Weber for inviting us here tonight to share this project. And it feels especially kind of exciting and important to be sharing this project here with this community, given my own time um, at the Bard Graduate Center. And I feel like my there's a certain kind of scholarly imprint that I have from my time here. So I'm really excited to see a lot of friends, former colleagues and mentors in the room tonight. So thank you. So in this part of our talk, I will shift away from questions of authorship posed by Nancy, and we'll discuss the making of the Mondrian dress, the, the kind of larger title of our talk. And what I will share is not so much about making in terms of the physical, physical construction of the Mondrian dress, uh, but, although that will be mentioned, uh, but rather about how in the context of the youth-oriented fashion markets of the mid-1960s, the Yves Saint Laurent brand expanded on one hand through licensed designer copying and on the other through the widespread circulation of fashion editorials in the pages of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, among others. Together, Sorry, me. Sorry about that. Uh, together, these brought these brought significant attention to Saint Laurent's now iconic designs, and ultimately secured pride of place in 20th century fashion history for one dress in particular, the model number 81 Mondrian dress, which was at the front of those uh, three on the slide. However, Yves Saint Laurent was not the first dress designer to seek inspiration in Mondrian's neoplastic style. Stella Brownie and Anne Klein had already done so in 1945 and 1961, respectively. Yet no matter how faithful to the paintings, which is arguable in the case of uh, Stella Brownie, <laughs> given the uh, diagonals at the front of the, the uh, suit jacket, um, they never achieved anything like the resonance of Saint Laurent's carefully pieced jersey dresses. Even before Saint Laurent's fall 1965 collection premiered, there was an immediate precedent for the massive popularity of abstract painting recycled as fashion. That spring, a dress and coat ensemble created for Roy Lichtenstein's then-girlfriend, performance artist Letty Lou Eisenhower, to wear to the opening of his second solo show at the Ilana Sonneben Paris Gallery, at first appeared quite conventional until the ivory-colored silk satin coat was removed to reveal a stunning silkscreen on satin version of Lichtenstein's painting Sunrise also from 1965. Covering the entire back of Eisenhower's dress, a red sun rises from the white clouds to spread its vivid yellow rays across the sky, the sky of red bende dots, while the artist's signature is unmistakable above the hem at the lower right. This bes bespoke one-off design put Lichtenstein's insistent pop imagery in dialogue with what would be otherwise unremarkable clothing as he sought to make a connection in his own work between art and fashion by way of imagery that would be instantly recognizable. At the same time, pop art's more perceptually driven affiliate, op art, spurred a wildly popular fashion trend that garnered a frenzy of interest among youthful consumers. Prompted in part by the February 1965 opening at New York's Museum of Modern Art, the op-dominated exhibition entitled The Responsive Eye uh, was wildly popular and set attendance records for a moment at the time, and this show fostered a sartorial efflorescence that Life magazine characterized as, quote, op from toe to top, end quote, in an editorial that revealed how several artists in the exhibition saw their paintings transformed into a range of fashion commodities, with or without their permission. As was the case of artist Bridget Riley, who saw her dots wander right off the painting onto, a, onto simple A-line dresses of patterned textiles produced by art collector, indeed a collector of Riley's work, and dress manufacturer Larry Aldrich. When the similar shift silhouettes of Saint Laurent's Mondrian dresses appeared only months later in early August, it no doubt seemed obvious, at least to some observers, that their ge geometry and multiple colors, as well as their basis in art appropriation, betrayed affinities with those same features of off dresses already in circulation. Even acknowledging their similarities, the affiliation with American op fashions goes only so far in accounting for the popularity of Saint Laurent's Mondrian dresses, which emerged in the vastly different context of haute couture in France. The dress's influence on both up and down market product streams, however, was immediately evident. 
as mentioned in its autumn 1965 newsletter, which sports a cover inspired by Mondrian's 1936 composition in white, black, and red. On September 10th, the New York-based fashion group International, an influential cohort of buyers, designers, and society figures, presented both imported original Mondrian dresses from the Maison de Couture and sanctioned copies produced for, for New York brand Susie Perrette and Lord & Taylor's department store at its annual fall luncheon. At the event, Glamour Magazine's editor-in-chief, Kathleen Ashton Casey, promoted Saint Laurent's dresses as, quote, the looks you have read about, the looks that have been brought to America so fast, you might well see one of them in the audience today. An advertisement published three days later in women's wear for the sportswear manufacturer Sport Tempos characterized the immediacy with which the Mondrian style circulated as having, quote, erupted with spontaneous combustion on a global scale, end quote resulting in an explosive circulation of visual and material appropriations perhaps best evidenced by the page from the Miami Herald that you saw just a few moments ago. Only a month later, and less than two months after the autumn-winter 1965 collection was introduced in mid-October, Saint Laurent and Berger, accompanied by head saleswoman Yvonne de Perimhoff, excuse me, and a small cadre of so-called Eve's girls, departed for a three-week tour of major American cities to promote the launch of the house's first perfume titled simply with the letter Y, or Y in French, and thereby affirmed the recently established business relationship with Lan Van Charles of the Ritz, which owned the license for the perfume in the United States. Visits to high-end department stores in New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, San Francisco, Dallas, and Atlanta frequently included exclusive meetings and press promotion, not only for the perfume, but also for the couturier's fall designs. It is not surprising that the Mondrian dress figured prominently since these were being aggressively produced, circulated and marketed high and low throughout the fashion system at this very moment. The breadth of Mondrian's appeal was not lost on Berger and Saint Laurent. Prior to their, prior to their departure from from Paris, the duo outlined their agenda to Thelma Sweetenberg of women's wear, ident identifying a few critical tasks. Saint Laurent planned to see what the American fashion industry had made of his Mondrian idea by shopping for copies of his iconic dresses, while Berger intended to view the authentic collection of Mondrians at MoMA. The couturier's enthusiasm for the down market reproductions was confirmed when, only a few days later, a women's wear reporter asked Yves, how he felt about the Mondrian copies. He replied, I like them very well. I consider it a stamp of success. And Saint Laurent had been true to his word. The New York Times reported on November 13th that he had purchased copies of his Jersey muted bar Mondrian dress together with the Polyakov dress, themselves based on the jigsaw-like forms of the paintings of Serge Polyakov, which were also in the autumn winter's 1965 collection. He purchased these dresses at Orbox, the New York department store famous in the 1950s and 1960s for its line-for-line -line copies of French couture. These purchases, when paired with Berger's mission to see the authentic Madrian paintings, make it patently clear that the dialectic of original and copy was an ever-present concern. A Washington Daily News page from September 23rd patently affirms the simultaneous circulation of the high-end copy and the cheaper imitation. A clever layout designer must have enjoyed pairing the advertisement for Franklin Simon's artful $8 Mondrian blouse alongside a headline that implored, the real Saint Laurent, step forward, please. Focused on the New York fall shows, the text explained, there are the Paris fashion openings and the New York designer openings, and then there are the openings in New York of American copies of Paris designs, end quote. The success for line-for-line -line copies of Orbach's and Alexander's, among other high-end department stores, confirms what journalist Ber Bernard Roshko claimed a few, few, excuse me, a few years <coughs> earlier in 1963. Quote, nowadays, the most creative and original couturiers derive a substantial part of their income from the models sold for copying in the United States. The trend of the times has made them designers for the wholesale trade as well as dressmakers for the luxury trade. To be clear, these might be licensed, yet still unquestionably pricey copies of Saint Laurent's dresses. 
end quote. Well, the quote ended after luxury trade, sorry. A model in the number 83 Mondrian dress in the collection of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco sports several woven labels at the neck that indicate its status as a couture original. This example has an additional typed label sewn into the hem, identifying it as a violet and beige wool jersey Mondrain, that's M-O-N-D-R-A-I-N, dress, end quote. And noted the price of the original as $1,795, which is approximately $19,000 today, and the locally produced copy for only $795, which is equals $10,000 today. Purchased from the Paris Couture House by I. Magnon Company, the premier retailer of Saint Laurent, California, until the mid-1970s, the dress was designed to be copied in the department store's own atelier in San Francisco, where the typed label was probably generated. At the end of the season, in late 1966, the garment was gifted to the museum as, according to the Northern California manager, L.A. Schultz, quote, the Mondrian original number 83 from East Saint Laurent's fall 1965 collection, end quote. Given the evidence of the labels and the gift to the museum, the dress is likely to have been a bonded garment imported by I. Magnon to be copied for its toniest clientele. As Alexandra Palmer has expertly shown in her work on Dior, such sample garments were sold to American retailers by French couture houses for promotional purposes, including fashion shows, advertisements, and perhaps more importantly, as the basis on which the stores would cre create approved copies and adaptations for sale. In order to avoid payment of steep tariffs, retailers were required to export the original bonded models or return them to the couture house within six months of their purchase. In some cases, importers and high-end department stores avoided financial penalties by donating the dress samples to American museums for pedagogical purposes, such as this one. Similarly, a model number 103 Mondrian dress with a more characteristic asymmetrical grid, but with color panels that clearly departed from the primaries that Mondrian so often deployed, was also a gift of iMagnon but this time it was to the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 1966. When we personally examined this dress at the museum in spring 2019, we were immediately confronted with the evidence of its commercial purpose. In addition to the label affixed to the inside of the hem, tracks of needle holes trace the former side and center back seams, suggesting that the dress was disassembled for a client's line for line copy at least once prior to its donation to the museum. The construction of the most characteristic Mondrian dresses is deceptive owing to their visual simplicity and was configured to adapt the flatness of the painter's style to the three-dimensional phys physical realities of the female body. The masterful way in which the curves of the wearer's bust, waist, and hips are imperceptibly accounted for and indeed effectively disguised in the jersey fabric by the subtle piecing of black lines and off-white or colored panels is one of the most impressive yet almost invisible aspects of these dresses. Rather than appropriating the exacting rectangular shapes common in Mondrian's paintings, Saint Laurent's staff carefully sewed trapezoid-like panels of matte wool fabric to the intersecting bands of black fabric that framed the panels. For example, the measurement of the Costume Institute's model number 81 dress reveal that the bottom widths of the lower white rectangular panels range from a half inch to a full inch wider than the width at the top. Devised to hide seam allowances and reduce bulk by mitering each panel's corners and to ensure the wearer's natural shape would not disrupt the planar effect of the couture dress, Thick padding was sometimes added below the shoulder seams and neckline to reduce any undue concave sloping that might exist between the clavicle and the high point of the bust. This expert construction exists in stark contrast to the simple grain ribbon or flat braid applique recommended for creating the mondrian -S grid in down market home sewing patterns. Like for in instance, the directions on the cover of the Simplicity's so-called Jiffy Dress paper pattern at left. 
In the years since the collection's premiere in 1965, the designation of the Mondrian dress has fluctuated to include as many as 26 dresses, a sum noted by the Fondation Pierre Berger et Saint Laurent in 2019. If we are puzzled by the Mondrian designation of dresses that look nothing like Mondrian's paintings, like those in the Femme Chic editorial, as well as that fabulous hot pink version that's in the collection of the Met, by the same token, we can only speculate as well as as well as to why other Saint Laurent dresses for which Mondrian's work was an, an obvious precedent. For example, model numbers four and 78 at left. These were not acknowledged as Mondrian dresses in any of the numerous exhibitions and accompanying, accompanying publications, including those produced by the Fondation that, have, that had addressed the subject in the last six decades. Did they perhaps diverge too much from the short cocktail dresses that received the lion's share of attention in 1965? Given the rigor and legibility of Mondrian's signature style, it is curious that the designation Mondrian, Mondrian dress has consistently lacked a corresponding degree of specificity. Any investigation into the production and circulation of Saint Laurent's Mondrian designs necessarily brings photography's dual and at times contradictory roles in both protecting and disseminating a designer's work into relief. In the hands of Berger, Saint Laurent, and their staff, the in-house photographs of a Mondrian dress operated on just this terrain. Given Berger's extensive efforts to prevent design piracy, a subject we take up in the book, even if Saint Laurent, like numerous couturiers before him, claimed to be flattered by the proliferation of unsanctioned copies of his designs, a suite of black and white photographs taken by Gerard Pata, one example is on the screen at left, circulated to help secure Saint Laurent's authorship of his original designs, while also simultaneously working to drum up early interest in the 1965 fall collection. Among buyers and licensees, presumably before the prohibition on distributing design details was lifted. Eventually, once this prohibition on press photography, which was put in place for each French couture collection by the Chambre Syndicale, had expired, leading women's magazines joined Women's Wear, the New York Times, and other newspapers in featuring Mondrian dresses worn by top models and photographs by notable fashion photographers. With the introduction of arresting, forcefully composed photographic images, the character of press coverage changed perceptibly, signif significantly contributing to the designs and Saint Laurent's popular success. A number of the fashion photographs register how the A-line, nearly columnar silhouette of the Mondrian dress constrains the body of the wearer and forces them to enact a host of unnatural poses, as the one on, in the uh, image with the model seated. By way of example, this unpublished photograph by Terry Fincher reveals the contorted physical condition opposed on a mannequin when modeling a Mondrian dress in a seated position. Here, the mannequin is positioned diagonally at the edge of the chair to minimize any folding or gathering of the fabric that would result from merely bending at the waist or hips. Her posture seemingly aims to preserve, albeit unsuccessfully, the austere, plainer design of the model number 77 Mondrian dress, which in this image is readily apparent from the waist up, but disrupted by the thick overlapping folds of the lower part of the dress. When compared to the relatively perfunctory pictures produced for the house by Pata, Fincher's images, and even more so those by Richard Avedon, Irving Penn, or David Bailey, bring pardon me, bring this into clear relief, or excuse me, bring into clear relief their skilled handling of poses in the service of creating a photograph with considerable, considerable aesthetic punch. In one of his last assignments for Harper's Bazaar, before moving to his rival, Vogue, Richard Avedon photographed Jean Shrimpton wearing two different versions of the Mondrian dress. The images bear out Susan Sontag's characterization of fashion as, quote, a reflection on clothes as costume, on the face as mask, on styles as signs, end quote. And she concluded in this 1978 Vogue editorial that in Avedon's work, fashion, quote, becomes a reflection on the nature of seeing and posing, that is, a reflection about art. This reading of Avedon's achievement underscores the qualitative difference between his work and that of, for example, Pata, 
And it also acknowledges that his photographs were appreciated not just for their documentary potential, but more importantly, for their aesthetic ambition and raw visual appeal. Likewise, Irving Penn conveyed the art quotient of Saint Laurent's Mondrian line, but with significantly different means. His composite image of three photographs shows Verushka posing frontally in three different versions of the Mondrian dress, arrayed horizontally across a two-page spread in vogue. Interestingly, the middle image is reversed, presumably in order to enhance the play of grids and colors between the dresses across two pages. Although the spread includes color, the medium is not full color photography, but rather black and white photography and offset printing with a limited use of spot color for the clothes. This treatment affords the colors a degree of autonomy for Verushka's body, which is represented in the same gray spectrum as the background plane. Her body faces the viewer and is cropped at the same height as the knee length hem of each dress, so that the photographic frame focuses the formal features of the designs, the grids and the colors, by aligning them with the flatness reminiscent again of a painting. This quality is no noticeably reinforced by the fact that the backs of the dresses, like the backs of an artist's canvas, are rarely revealed and almost never, if ever, visible in any of the press or publicity pho photographs of the period. A no doubt purposeful refusal that effectively distilled the designs into an iconic and singularly frontal graphic composition and, perhaps unwittingly, made the dresses all the more ripe for appropriation by down market copyists. One important exception is the video clip that Nancy showed, which you actually get to see the back of the dress and the kind of trimming around the collar um, on the reverse. But Verusha's arms are positioned differently in each case so as to create a variety of angles in relation to, and notably away from, her body, ensuring that the limbs do not overlap with or disrupt the pristine visual plane of each dress. The caption for this image reads, quote, clean, terse, white jersey rectangles, Mondrian proportions, bold, black tape, blocks of color laid on like fresh paint, end quote. This short text offers to the reader an, an evocation of the character of the forms as if they had been applied by an artist rather than sewn by an atelier seamstress. Using short staccato phrases while also making the visual and verbal connection to Mondrian's paintings unmistakable. And finally, David Bailey's full color, full color cover image for the September 1965 issue of Vogue noticeably exploits the most salient components of the Mondrian style, which has the effect of deftly telegraphing the, dresses designs, the dress design's aesthetic debt to the painter. The photograph presents English model Moira Swan in the soon-to-be iconic model number 81. Distinguished by an asymmetrical grid as well as a multicolored formal arrangement of seemingly rectangular planes, this model is arguably Saint Laurent's most convincing appropriation of Mondrian's signature compositional style. Not only was this the first Mondrian dress to appear on the cover of a fashion magazine, but its bright colors and powerful graphic forms were rendered especially vigorous by the comportment of Swan, who Bailey captured on one foot as she appears to move diagonally across the bright white ground of the cover's printed page. Underscoring the off-kilter dynamis dynamism of this image, the graphic layout and assorted typography on the cover accentuate Swan's jaunty comportment. The U of the Vogue's Kelly Green masthead tautly frames the left side of her face. The all-white background nearly merges with the white segments of the dress to deflate and flatten her body, an effect reinforced by the text set across her thigh, rendering Swan not not as a mere armature for the dress, but instead as a figure that coheres with the fundamentally planar quality of the dress's Mondrian-esque design. Underscoring, underscoring the importance of Bailey's image in the promotion of the Mondrian dresses, the Fondation Pierre Berger et Saint Laurent paid homage to Bailey's image on the cover of the, of the uh, Dialogue avec l'Art exhibition brochure in 2004. And attesting 
to the critical significance of this design for Saint Laurent, he revisited it decades later for a couture suit in 1980 and then in a woven mini dress in 1997 for his ready to wear line Saint Laurent Rive Gauche, which, when introduced in 1966, capitalized on the popular success of the Mondrian line just a year earlier, an episode we addressed more fully in the book. In this project, Nancy and I show how despite the broader Mondrian de dress designation among Saint Laurent's fall 1965 collection, the entire category ultimately collapsed upon one dress design, the model number 81, which as we have already shown, exhibits the closest visual appropriation of Mondrian's signature abstract paintings. Today, almost always, we speak of a singular Mondrian dress rather than a larger cohort of dresses, whether that be only two dresses, including the second most rec recognizable dress, the model number 77 with the red rectangle on the shoulder, or the full suite of 26 dresses that at the time of their release circulated under the Mondrian rubric. Nancy and I have touched upon some of the modes by which this distillation occurred, but as we again explore in the book, a significant factor in this process was St. Laurent's and Berger's retrospective editing, which resulted in this particular design serving as a brand icon for the couturier's work in multiple instances, including in the jewel box like Studio, Studio KO designed entrance to the inaugural 2017 exhibition dedicated to the highlights of St. Laurent's career at the Musée St. Laurent Marrakech which we believe remains standing today, despite the horrific destruction in Morocco at this time. And the dress most recently in 2022 was featured in a series of museum interventions in Paris, all around Paris, really. It was a bit of a treasure hunt <laughs> uh, that celebrated Saint Laurent's much vaunted dialogue with art and that were collectively known as E Saint Laurent au Musées. Where the Centre Pompidou, where at the Centre Pompidou, the model number 81 dress hangs, isolated from the context of its creation, and installed almost as if a modern painting alongside Mondrian's 1937 composition in red, blue, and white, number two. And to close, I will return to the Sport Tempo's advertisement for women's wear I noted earlier and share the interrogative the company so boldly posed on September 13th, exactly 58 years ago today, which asked, where would 7th Avenue be if Saint Laurent's mother gave him a tie for Christmas instead of a book? Thank you. <laughs> And I think we might have time for a few questions. Just to say, I would love to hear uh, how the two of you came together for this project. <laughs> so Anne came to, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So Anne came uh, to Stanford to complete a PhD in uh, art history, but she came from Bard with a background, as, as you know, um, as an expert in, um, I would say, uh, a couple of different subjects that I'm not expert in at all. Um, among many things that she brought to this project, um, which at the time we thought was going to be an exhibition, and um, there was the possibility of it being an exhibition at the Cantor Art Center at Stanford. It was a very remote possibility because in certain ways, you know, Stanford borrowing Mondrian paintings and, and all that kind of thing was a bit of pie in the sky. But it was on the calendar for a while and we worked on it assiduously and Anne became very, very engaged in that project. So that was um, really important. We also both participated in a graduate seminar um, that was generated around this exhibition, which I taught, she was a student, but a very, very important one, partly because of her background and experience as a curator who was capable of working with textiles and clothing. Um, she describes cer seeing certain things in, for example, at LACMA, in the inside of their Mondrian dress. And believe me, as an art historian, I would not have known how to track the um, stitching to 
learn anything about that. So, it, you know, her knowledge of real um, sort of curatorial and uh, material objects was extremely important, and I think also um, her knowledge of photography and the ways in which um, photographs work to record and um, represent fashion. So um, over the course of a few years, um, it was not so much a, let's say, mentor-student relationship, but um, one of equals. And yet, of course, that's challenging for the student to be working with her professor. We won't say it like the Germans do, but um, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so she's, as you can tell, extremely mature and self-assured, and she stepped up to the plate and really made a major contribution to the book and to the whole project. So um, we became partners and co-authors. That's all very kind. Thank you. Um, we haven't had that question asked to us in a public forum, so I haven't heard such a I've heard nice things before, but certainly that was lovely. Um, I will say that I, you know, everything that Nancy just shared, shared is absolutely correct, but I, you know, became more and more invested in this project and really curious about how do, how do you answer this question, what is a Mondrian dress, which in the book, you know, we kind of have these overlapping episodes where we ask that question again and again, and so I just became really fascinated by this object, which as we've shown, and as I'm sure many of you know, kind of has circulated and, and is kind of in the consciousness of anyone kind of looking at fashion and, and modern art history. So it was really a great privilege to and, get to And we have a Mondrian dress in our audience, of course. It's true. <laughs> so, I don't know if you want to stand up, but this is one that is in our book. So, mm -hmm. uh, and and yes. we know the designer who's a young, Dutch designer today, and he made that design um, around uh, 2012, 2011-12, I think, for the first time. Thank you very much for your talk. As, as a segue from that last point, do you know anything about the women who wore the original haute couture versions and whether they were wearing Yves Saint Laurent, whether they were wearing fashion or whether they were wearing Mondrian, did you do any, were you able to do any research on, on that aspect? Yes, I, I went to the archive at the East Saint Laurent Foundation and they have incomplete ledger books that in the, in what we kind of learned was this, the one ledger book I was able to look at, there may be more, but I, this is the one that they had. And so it, it did indicate who the buyers were. And in fact, the sales, you know, th there were not a lot of dresses sold at the time, right? And, but the copies, certainly I think we're more um, financially successful for these department stores and obviously the kickback went to East Saint Laurent as well. Um, so there was, there was an ability to track some of them and certainly of course there's donation records to museums, right? So the East Saint Laurent dresses that were donated to the Met and um, of course LACMA and Young are both um, from department stores. But So there was a little bit we could find out but given the at least in my, to my knowledge, given the kind of incompleteness of the record, there, it wasn't, there wasn't so many stories we could tell about those who are wearing it. I mean, I think, and there's photographs, certainly, of Princess Grace wearing, wearing the number 77 dress, but... Dame Margot Fontaine is another mm -hmm. famous mm -hmm. uh, wearer of the dress, but um, so there are names and addresses, and there is a financial record in this uh, record book um, they have that for every season, and they do not really, I mean, they treat this like the confidential relationship that uh, existed at the time. They do not, they were generous with us, I would say. Um, one of the really challenging features of working on Yves Saint Laurent, as distinct, I would say, I don't really know exactly how Alexandra Palmer found her you know, what the conditions were for her access to the Dior records. But first of all, Dior had business records, which Yves Saint Laurent, so far as we know, did not keep. Um, and that's a crucial thing, obviously, trying to reconstruct all sorts of issues. Um, so it would have been really valuable if he had done that. Um, so that's one thing. But there are prices indicated in these books 
there are some, a lot of people had discounts and some, they also seemed to be able to return the thing after they had ordered it. So, so it's a little hard to kind of uh, follow all of that, but really interesting. And there are a lot of Americans, wealthy Americans. So probably all of you know that in order at the time to qualify as a couture dress, there were requirements for how you um, how many times you had to be fitted. You couldn't just buy the dress. And I believe that that was still the case in some, to some degree in the American department stores that were selling the most, um, what is it, closest copies um, or versions. So, you know, it was a kind of like big commitment of time, money, and lifestyle to continue to wear these dresses, which is why so something we just didn't talk about tonight, but which is a really important part of the book actually, is the, um, the ways in which the Mondrian dress sort of segued into the creation of Yves Saint Laurent Rive Gauche, where there was no Mondrian dress, but we show all sorts of ways in which um, Yves Saint Laurent thought about the Mondrian dress at the time he was doing that. And we compare the kind of commercialization and the vast, construction of many Mondrian dresses to the industrialization um, uh, that interested pop artists. And they're, we're trying in the book to kind of create a conceptual and intellectual ground for tying together. And there are other ways to tie them together too. Um, Yves Saint Laurent and Andy Warhol were good friends or pretty good friends and you know they shared other good friends and um, we know that he looked at pop art. Um, so anyway, I'm just sort of growing out of what you asked. Um, the whole sort of nature of business is something really important to Anna and me and um, it's always hard. I, I don't know, there, I would say that the literature now that is studying the rise of ready to wear has a, you know, contributes a tremendous amount of information to thinking about this transition in the 1960s. It's coinciding not just with what was happening in English, um, you know, in London with and and so on, but also with, um, you know, the feminist movement and the changes in behaviors of women, which. I don't know that. So these numbers of potential clients was crashing really around this time, and Salomon was really committed to keeping it up, which he did. That is couture throughout his career. Any other questions? Yeah. Just a quick question. I was hoping you could address, in your perspective, the difference where inspiration crosses the line and becomes a copy. <laughs> what did you think? <laughs> well, I think as we tried to show, you know, that, that there's no line there. It's quite blurry, right? And it does, but, you know, there are these down market copies, which are, you know, unquestionably a copy and not because they're, I think a lot of what we talk about and what the research shows is they're driven by the market, right? So even that's the Sport Tempos ad talks about Seventh Avenue, making the Mondrian designs as at the same time, as, as so they say, as Yves Saint Laurent, right? So I think there, the line for inspiration and copy is one that I, I think shifts, you know, on a case by case basis. But I think it's clear to say that for the down market copies, it's unquestionable um, that they kind of, it's not really about inspiration, but it's about the market. So just to add to that, we would, you know, acknowledge that couture, which we've, you know, this has been acknowledged before, but couture is about a model that is made to be copied. So the copy resides in couture already. I mean, I think you're talking about a different kind of copy or, um, you know, and we do, excuse me? Right. So of course, Yves Saint Laurent and the people who promote him as an artist or as a which which he 
was ambivalent about. I mean, his status, um, and we argue that Pierre Berger is the person who really created their art collection, which Yves Saint Laurent was very identified with, um, but maybe didn't really participate that much in selecting objects and so on. So there's a lot of constructing of Yves Saint Laurent um, as, but he was undoubtedly just an incredibly important and very brilliant uh, dress designer as well. So it's a really complicated story. And so Andrew was asking, well, what's the question you would like to ask at the end, you know, that you still have? And maybe it's that one, you know, like, so we're, we're acknowledging that these are issues to be uh, discussed and kind of, we think they're, we're, after having worked on it for a really long time, we're still interested. So we'd be interested to hear what, what you have to say. But clearly, the copy, the appropriation, and so on is so important for contemporary for contemporary art, you know, even figuring out what is an authentic Warhol, even if he signed the object, we still, you know, there are people who say, well, it's not by Warhol, so that doesn't make any difference. I, I, anyway, we're very conscious of this as a problematic that probably nobody's going to solve. Hi. Um, my question is whether you looked at the way in which this dress affected Mondrian scholarship and Mondrian um, sort of popularity. Was there a rising interest in Mondrian before this show? Did you find that this show was capitalizing on this already increasing amount or was this an, a moment where Mondrian was getting new attention? So from the nineteen six from the moment nineteen sixty five I think is what you're asking and what uh, is the case is that Mondrian was little known relatively little known in France there were no Mondrians in public collections at the time and the claim has been made by Pierre Berger and others at the time of the auction of the Mondri of their collection um, in two thousand nine that. Yves Saint Laurent was responsible for the popularization of or the knowledge, let's say, that he bought these paintings really earlier than the state and all sorts of things like that. I, um, I think it's, it's interesting. That's one of the things that I think is so interesting about the fact that he didn't, he had never seen a Mondrian painting. And he not only, I mean, another way to think about this is that at the time that he made the Mondrian dress line, um, if we assume that they were self-conscious about it, they never called it a Mondrian dress or any of that, he also knew Polyakov, and he made two Polyakov dresses that were shown, and that just sort of never made it into the Mondrian level of um, public awareness and popularity. But, you know, I've come to think, we don't really argue this in the book, but probably he and Pierre Berger said, wow, maybe we should really get on this, you know, merry-go-round and ride it wherever, it, or whatever it is, the train, and ride it where it's going to take us. Because I'm not sure that until that happened, he necessarily, I mean, maybe he would have liked Polyakov just as well. He actually knew Polyakov, apparently. Yes, they had, they had, they partied together. <laughs> they partied together. Yeah. They had some, there were some documented parties that they were together at. So I think that's really interesting. I, w I would say that Mondrian was far better known, and certainly in the United States, which was the principal uh, marketplace for Yves Saint Laurent, his work was shown publicly at MoMA since 1945 in retrospective, but also continuously or, or you know, on and off. And he had a dealer, Sidney Janis, who showed regular exhibitions of Mondrian's work. And this was just not the case with Polyakov. Um, so anyway, so Polyakov sort of was always in the picture, but just never as important, um, I think. 
as, as an older area. I'll add one small thing to that, which is that Mondrian was already circulating within popular culture prior to this moment. Certainly it had a, a kind of efflorescence much earlier, right? Um, and even there's a 1963 Life article that actually talks about a non, not a Campbell Soup, Campbell Soup dress, not the paper dress that maybe you saw down the street at MAD a couple weeks ago, um, but one that was by this firm called Crazy Horse that had a large Campbell Soup, kind of single candle soup, Campbell Soup, excuse me, print on it. But in the text for the article, the author equates it to Mondrian, saying you've seen Formica in Mondrian patterns. You've seen all of this kind of, you know, all of this popular culture, this material culture in the Mondrian style um, that was fashionable. So there's a, this kind of cyclical aspect to it that there was a, you know, Mondrian was certainly a known entity outside of the halls of modern art um, at this time already. Please join me in thanking Anna and Nancy for this wonderful <laughs> evening.